of authorship two years ago and not wanting to to give up what we had built and were building and at this point in time I'm saying do we want to continue in a type of business where we have high risk high exposure to risk or do we want to repackage what we do our concept was to build our own clinics and have a network of them and then have enough of a base to say we franchise this idea what did I say to you when you first told me that I don't remember now I remember you're the veterinary lady but uh, but I don't remember what I said what did I say when you told me your concept was to franchise them what did I tell you uh, the main thing that stuck with me Dan was what I got out of when you're when you're working in a business where you're selling your hours mm -hmm. you know that's a tough way to make a lot of money uh, it's not a tough, it's impossible. I right, mean, right. It's, it's worse than tough, it's impossible. Yeah. And, and, and did your son come down and hear me in San Diego? No, I heard you in San Diego. My son went to another <laughs> seminar that gave him a lot of information on licensing products and that type of thing. Okay. Okay, number one, you should, you know, you should not take two years to figure out that you can let go of pride of authorship. If you can't figure that out in about two microseconds, something's wrong. I mean, you know, like this young lady who's 26 who figured out that she's got a shit can of business. I mean, yeah, two months out, you know, with, with the greatest respect. And again, I, when I say these things, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm not trying to hurt or offend any uh, feminists we have in the room. But that takes big nuts. That takes big nuts. I mean... And, and, and there's no doubt in my military civilian mind this young lady's going to be successful. None. Zero. Excuse me. And, and because if you can make a decision that quickly, with that little experience, and catch the point, the whole point of what I'm about, the whole, do you realize the whole essence of what quantum theory is about? This young lady, we've got to swap bad stories, don't forget, remind me. I mean, this young lady has, I mean... As, as, I mean, that's great, you know? It, may, it makes this whole three days worthwhile to me. Because that's what it's about. Remember, it's a complete reversal going up the other face of the Matterhorn. And Rick Scott will sell out of health, health care just before, when everybody thinks he's gonna own the entire health care industry, he'll sell it to some doofus like Cigna or somebody that's afraid that they're gonna lose market share, which they already have. Because nothing's forever. I wrote him a letter about a year ago. I said, remember three things. Glorious fleeting. Nothing's forever. No up cycle or no down cycle. Number one. Number two, he's been married to his high school sweetheart all these years. He, he still drives a 1987 Buick. He didn't buy it with a radio because he wouldn't pay extra. True story. And I tell, I said, hey, get a new car, Rick. <laughs> you know, when you're worth a half a billion dollars, you can afford a new car. So he probably went up to an Oldsmobile. Probably brought one from Brownie. I know, you know, buy, buy, yeah, buy a new car. Just, just one moment, man. And, and I said, number three, you know, spend time with your kids, because I didn't, but I, I think you should. And so, um, but that's what it's about. Now, as it, it, far as your, your, your quandary with the, the veterinary medicine uh, and, uh, and the competition, the, uh, if I remember correctly, you said that there was uh, what I call systematized veterinary medicine coming in then, two years ago. But now, I just told you that in San Diego. Okay, okay, okay. In San Diego, you told me that. Okay. Yeah. The, um, it's tough to, 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 to lock heads with an organization that's got those built, that built-in market. You know, it's absolutely tough. And that's not any place... When you're going into somebody that can control the market because they control both ends of the market. And that's, that's, that's not a good business to get rich in. And the, uh, unless you've got big capital, and if you've got a lot of capital, I can tell you other businesses get richer a lot quicker than, than going in and fighting that. The, um, but um, I think you're right. And, and, and one of the things that I would disagree with is you don't have to wait till a cash flow business to come in the door before you sell the cash flow business you've got. That's, that's not, that's, I don't agree with that because you're staying in a business that you know is a dead end or, or almost a dead end business now 
and you, you, if you kiss a lot of frogs and you expose yourself not to so much a lot of seminars, but you expose yourself to a lot of deals because a lot of the ideas behind the seminars other than this one is networking where you pass out cards and you've got bulletin boards. We don't do any of that. You know, because I don't, I don't care if anybody here does business with anybody else. That, that's not why we're here. Uh, you know, I'm not, uh, in theory, I'm not a marketing guy, but I know a lot about marketing. But we're here to hopefully, in my mind, I will have given everything you need to change your whole way of thinking, your whole mindset about how you look at business. There's no doubt in that. But whether you do it or not, you know, that's another, another question. And, and, and I can't, you know, you can bring a horse to water, or you, but you can't make a drink. And, you know, and um, I can't do that. That's not, that's not my job. With a few of you, hopefully I'll work with a few of you. But if that doesn't work out either, it doesn't, you know, won't change my lifestyle any, I can assure you. But I will have given you the information. That's where I, you know, feel that my job ends for most of you. So I would sell the business. I wouldn't worry, for, I wouldn't worry about another cash flow business. You'll find one. It'll give you more time to find that cash flow business if you're not dealing in the business that you're already are inclined to get rid of anyway. So we're going to sell it to one of the associates. Yeah. We're going to tell him Friday, next Friday. Absolutely. Okay, sir. Um, my name is Chris Travis. I'm from Vancouver, Canada, by way of uh, Trinidad, the Caribbean, and uh, I've been living down here in California on and off for about ten years. You're talking about doofus Canadians. I realized that. That's why I came down here and went to college and uh, tried to learn a little bit about making money because it seemed like it was pretty hard to do up in Canada. A lot of doofuses up there. A lot of doofuses, yeah. Uh, my background is telemarketing, uh, specifically calling total strangers up and having them send me thousands of dollars. I like doing it. I've been successful at it. I was involved in wireless cable TV until that whole market went sideways on me. I'm currently looking at forming my own independent ISO and jumping into the debit telephone debit card market which is uh, mm -hmm. big over in Europe and big in Japan the the big companies AT&T have been trying to get it accepted but they've been having some problems because they're still thinking the old way I'm hoping with some of my techniques I learned here that I can get some kind of control over it or find out if it's even worth my while messing with it and so right in, right now I'm in transition from quitting what I'm doing which is I'm working for a small brokerage firm here in Torrance to raising, having my own investors and, and just doing my own thing. And uh, the reason why I'm here is because I'm an ex-seminar junkie, so to speak, because I was not going to go to this seminar uh, because I've been to Jay Abraham's and uh, you know, I've been to other seminars too. Uh, I was impressed with Ted Nicholas and he made a recommendation that this was, I think, the best seminar he'd been to, I think, if I'm he not mistaken. He, Ted Nicholas, who's, in my judgment, arguably the best copywriter in the country, he said he learned 103 th ways to increase his net worth geometrically from me. 103. That was the only reason I came, because I was through with seminars. I spent thousands of dollars. I have a library that's the size of a storage unit of you name it. <laughs> and I've read every single book there is. 99% of the books that are out there are garbage by people who've never been there. And that's why I'm here. If, if it, if I knew it I wasn't, liked this kid right away. See? If, I knew <laughs> I liked this kid. By the way, you're sitting behind a guy that knows about debit marketing debit right card. there debit card okay so that's the only reason I showed up because I was pretty much through with seminars you know, mm -hmm. I, you know I've, I've heard it all I could I'm, I'm qualified to give them quite frankly but the the old doofus way <laughs> the old doofus way okay um, number one I told you you just coincident you sit, you're, you're sitting behind a guy that knows a lot about what you're interested in um, number two Ted who I have a lot of respect for he's one of the ones that I would spend money and I have gone to his seminars. Ted is a very knowledgeable guy, and he's got money. He's made money. He built a business. He built a publishing business and sold it to some doofus big company for about five times more than it was worth. So he's one of the few. I said there's a few. There's not many. There's a few. And he's one of them. And, I, and, I take a, uh, and he's been to my seminar at the castle, and he's heard me speak here in the United States. And, uh, of course, he doesn't live too far from Scotland. He lives in Switzerland uh, most of the time, and Florida the rest of the time. And so... Um, the um, you will come away with the ideas that uh, and the foundation that you need uh, and uh, I agree I think telecommunications and that you know any of uh, the ancillary businesses there 
are are going to be big. They're going to be just huge in the rest of this decade and into the next century because that's the way a lot of things are going. I mean, you're going to be able to buy and sell and, and, and both in this country and Asia and all around the world. And so I think that's a big business. That's one of the reasons that I've looked at it very closely. We're going to take a break? Okay. Take like 15 minutes? Well, no, why 15? We need 15. Huh? Yeah, we have a little technical difficulty. Okay, 15. Who did we leave off with? Right here. Yes, sir. Your name, where you're from, uh, what you do. Okay, my, my name is, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. My name is Mark Bowen. I, um, I'm from the San Fernando Valley, not far from where you are, where you uh, were from. Um, my business is basically involving network marketing. It's uh, a little bit different than most of your businesses here. And uh, what it is, is we have 12 products. And when you become a distributor in my company, you're allowed to take any one of those products and make a business out of it. And what I've done is I've been able to look at some of the products and make up my mind as to what I wanted to do with it. If it fit my profile of what I needed to do, what I could do, I went out and I started a business in it. So I basically have two businesses running off of the 12 products this company has allowed me to get my hands on. Uh, the thing about it that's really interesting is that we are on a new wave of environmental technology. Um, waterless and water saving technology is what we're about. Um, the company's called Envirotech International. They're out of Las Vegas. My company is called Ecotech International. And that's where I do my product. I sell my products and I buy from them. So they have exclusive formulations that I can buy as a distributor and I turn around and I sell these to people who I feel would be interested in my product. I've uh, spawned a beauty supply business because some, some of our products are skin care line, hair care, what have you. And uh, it's working out very well. I have a goal of making a certain amount per month which in a year I don't see any problem, problem doing, um, which is basically about 20000 a month, which is not much in the scope of s what some people are looking at here, but it'll springboard me to go into the next step, which will be bigger business. Um, I, really, I really don't have goals beyond that because I, I can say that 20000 a month may not sound like much to some people here but for me that's a, a fairly good amount of money and I know I can achieve that so that's my goal and I did have I did want to say one thing that I like about the business I'm in um, J. Paul Getty once said that he would rather have one percent of a hundred people's efforts than a hundred percent of his own which is what network marketing offers me. I get paid basically on the efforts of others. I get a percentage off of every bottle of the products that someone in my so-called downline sells or buys from the company of my product. The company sends me a check for that amount. Well, I can say that it is growing and it's growing very rapidly and uh, really and we have a saying in our business, the stickers will get rich. If you have a good Ooh. company, the stickers. The stickers, the people that stay with it. Oh, stick it out. The, the oh. people that stay with it and, and don't come in and, and not work the business will get rich. And with our company, we feel we have the best company out there. They pay the highest compensation available in the market today. Um, they're getting accolades all over the United States and all over the world. It's basically an international business. There's nowhere that you cannot do my business. So I'm very excited. I could go to Hawaii and do my business. I can go to Thailand and do my business. And that's one of the things I like. It offers flexibility beyond anything else I've done. I've had other businesses which, you know, didn't, unfortunately did not work out. 
but this one is, and I'm very excited. And really, what I wanted to do is I wanted to ask you, Mr. Pena, what do you feel about network marketing? Okay. Uh, three things. What is that? A gun on your... What is that on your hip? <laughs> well, that's my, one of my products. It's called... You guys will be hearing about it sooner or later. It's called Dry Wash and Guard. And what this does is this poly washes, polishes, and protects puts a protective sealant on a vehicle without a single drop of water. And water, this, huh? a bottle this size will last you approximately one year on one vehicle. One year? Hmm. Okay. And I, I can show it to anyone who's interested okay. in Okay. Well, I, I assume that's why you're wearing it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I keep my business with me at Okay. All time. By the way, Ed, you never look better. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> One, uh, several comments. Number one, J. Paul Getty, uh, what he said about uh, he'd rather have the 1% uh, of uh, 100 people. Than, I mean, remember what I said, you don't get paid for what you do, but you get paid for what you get other people to do. So in that regard, I like network marketing. I don't like most of the things that are sold through network marketing, but I like the concept. The concept is a smart concept. The concept is highly intelligent. I don't know who the hell invented it or started it. But, I mean, it's the products. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's wrought with a lot of bad products. I'm not saying this is one that sounds like a good one. But uh, whenever you can get paid for other people doing your work, I like that. And, and uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a different way, that's what Rick Scott does by empowering all his hundreds of regional managers, $1 million uh, opportunities to make decisions without having to go to the board of directors. So I like that. I like network marketing. Sure. Okay. The the thing about this business is yes, you'll make a lot of money and uh and that for some people is their motivation. What motivates me about this business and my products and everything, they're fantastic. These you know, there are a lot of really good products out there. Unfortunately they're maybe not marketed correctly and that's why they go to network marketing. But um in in my case I really get a thrill out of being able to help others. And, and empowering them by putting them into business for a nominal fee, a minimal fee of 39 bucks, one could join my company as an independent distributor, go out and do exactly what I did, build a business for a very small fee. All you need is product and uh, a little bit of training, and you can have a business no matter what background you're from, um, race, creed, color, what have you. Um, and you don't have to be wealthy, you don't have to make a large investment. And these are the key things that I like about my business. Second thing I would comment on is don't apologize for how much money you, you think you're going to make. Don't say ever say if you're going to be on the quantum leap uh, 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 road to success, don't say it may not be a lot of money to you, but it's a lot of money to me. Because you don't care what these other people think, because you don't care what the morons think, remember? I don't care what the morons say, and I'm not. There's a few morons here. I hope there's not too many, but just the odds would say there got to be some morons in here, you know, based on my experience. Uh, so don't apologize. Third, I would say that instead of saying that twenty thousand dollars a month, you ought to say two hundred thousand dollars a month, five hundred thousand, whatever. Pick a number that seems uh, a number that you want, and because. I guarantee you, you won't do more than $20,000 a month if you say $20,000 a month. The odds are you're going to do a lot less than $20,000 a month. And uh, so, but I, I think network marketing is good. I think it's a good way to make money. Uh, and as long as you operate it uh, ethically, which I'm sure you do, uh, I have no problem with it. I think it, it, it's, it's got a great future. Uh, next, the gentleman behind you. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Carlos Godinez, and I'm... Uh first time to the seminar. I'm very excited to be here. I thought I'd come here to the seminar and get refocused on some of my objectives and goals. Uh, maybe get some new juice in my body so I could go out there and be successful. You came to the right place if you want cement pumped up your ass. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. You come to the right place. And um, maybe make some changes in my uh, existing life so that way I could... Uh, continue to focus and be successful and feel good and confident, although I do now, but I, I think I want a little bit more in life. And uh, I have a business with my partner. She's going to be here this afternoon. I came here in lieu of her, but I'm more excited to be here than I than she would. I feel like calling her and, come on over, hurry up what you're doing, because this is exciting. 
Um, I'm in the dry cleaning industry. Uh, I started with no money, and all I did was uh, a little gutsy. I got fired from my job. Uh, I had, it was a commercial lender, made a raw deal, but it was the best thing that ever happened. It made me buy a house. I was unemployed for four years, uh, paid off $35,000 worth of debt, and uh, did consulting work, and uh, learned a lot, and learning a lot more. So I, I, I want to do a lot more with uh, this existing business or a new one that I have in mind. Now, I don't know if the, uh, when I was a kid, when I was 13, 14, I worked for a sweatshop, dry cleaning place, a guy named Al, I can't think of his name now. He owned, uh, he was the largest dry cleaning uh, operator in Los Angeles, city limits. Is that who it was? I don't remember the last name. But I worked for him. You couldn't work when you were 13 or 14 in the state of California. But I worked and I got paid, I think I got paid a dollar an hour. And then during the summer, I used to work 60 hours a week when I was 12 years old on his biggest state. He paid me a dollar ten an hour and I got ten minutes break for lunch and no breaks during the day and I used to make at that time I used to make about sixty to seventy dollars a week cash when you're twelve years old in 1957 that was a lot of money and the uh, but the economics about the dry cleaning business because he used to show me of course he wasn't paying anybody any money and I don't know if he I guess you can't do that anymore but I mean he showed me the economics Dan you get 59 cents for the shirt and the, the two dollars for this and our cost is about a minus two cents and and then and then I don't pay these people anyway because you throw them out because they're illegal aliens you throw their ass out and and if you can manage them a little because I spoke a little Spanish and so you manage you can help me you know I'll give you a dime extra an hour that's how come I got a dollar ten because I was a manager at 12 years old 13 years old so now if the economics are the same in the dry cleaning business I like it I don't like the way I was introduced to the dry cleaning business but the, the, uh, the dry cleaning business, you know, that was, in fact, that my first business exposure was in the dry cleaning. Unfortunately, it was a sweatshop, and, but, um, the, um, but as I said, when you got fired earlier, it forced you to make a decision to do something, okay? And, and it was the right decision. And absolutely. He went out and bought a house. And one of the things I'm going to talk to you about in, uh, tomorrow is I spend at least 110% of my income each year, minimum. My wife has increased that in recent years to two to three hundred percent of my income, and I make some, I make a lot of income in a year. But the because it's not what I I know that I'm not going to get rich off my income. I'm going to get rich off my equity in transactions. But I mean, and so the fact that you went out and bought a house, even though you, you got fired, and the, this scenario that you went through is is very much analogous to how I got started. And so. Uh, I'm sure that you're going to come away with uh, ideas uh, over the next two days that are going to help you build your business, uh, and um, and I'm excited for you. Thank you, Very good. Uh, my name is Kathleen Shaw, and I'm from right here, Redondo Beach, and uh, I'm in that envious spot of having a new business. I've been uh, opened up a private investigation business about a year ago, uh, and. So I was coming just to listen to see what ideas I'd have in growing this business. Now, I'm not quite sure how you grow a service industry business like this and fit it into your ideas of equity. Uh, so that's where I'm trying to draw the parallel. Okay. Well, I'll give you a quick parallel right now. You do, you get a big, uh, which I don't know if they call a contingent client in, 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 in the PI business, but you get a big contingent client that, you know, and you will run in, you know, uh, into these people that are in dire need, have no cash. You know, and they need work done. Maybe everybody comes to you guys like that, and 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 you say, okay, I'll do it for five or ten or twenty percent of your business, or two percent or whatever. And so that's one way to to turn uh, that uh, into a uh, an equity position because you're taking equity for what you do. Another way of doing it is um, uh, is to seek out a huge client and uh, offer to do work, assuming which I'm sure is the case that you know that you can compete competitively. And, and do the work as good, if not better, than a big company and say that I'll do this work for you for the next one month, three months, six months, a year, for nothing. At the end of that time, contingent on my success, I'll get a piece of this, I'll get something. And, and contrary to you know, what you've been told, people will do, do that. People will, will allow you to get into equity. And because service businesses, the theories and the precepts that I, that I use are the same theories and precepts I used on Wall Street. 
and there's no bigger service business than Wall Street. I mean, and I made it successfully, I made it happen successfully on Wall Street. And whereas I took pieces of business, in fact, one of the reasons I left Wall Street, and Jerry Orman might remember this, uh, Barry Stearns didn't want to do an equity or do a corporate finance deal that I thought was a good deal in Indonesia. And I thought it was a good deal, it was with Pat. And uh, they didn't want it. And I said, well, can I do it? And he says, just don't embarrass me. Well, I still get income from Indonesia. That was the first oil deal I ever did in the Salawati field. Uh, and I still get that income. And that was in 1976 or seven or something. Yeah, but Bear Stearns didn't want to do it. And I got permission from Bear Stearns. And, and then after it became successful, Bear Stearns wanted me to sign it over to him. And I reminded, of course, they lost all the paperwork. They don't remember all the things that we signed. And that's ultimately one of the reasons I left Bear Stearns. But uh, the, um, so you can turn service into equity. And, uh, and I'm assuming everybody's good at what they do. I know that's a big assumption, and the assumptions of mother are all screw-ups, but I'm assuming if you're good, you can turn it into equity. I'll give it to uh, one of the doofus brothers. My doofus brothers. What a, what a great introduction. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jim Mosby, and I'm from St. Louis. Uh, I've, I met Dan through a different seminar. I, I was out in a seminar in Palm Springs or Palm Desert or one of the palms out there, and uh, it's one of the people he mentioned, the, the Newman uh, seminar. And um, the, it was a great seminar, but I found that I, I was learning a lot more from just uh, a few drinks with Dan afterwards than I was at the seminar. A lot of drinks with a lot Dan. Of, a lot of drinks with Dan afterwards. Um, and a lot of things that I was, I always kind of said under my breath because I knew people would disagree with me. I didn't find that disagreement. So I thought, well, you know, there's something here. Um, and I quickly figured out after the seminar, there was two goals I had when I left there. One was to be one of his doofus brothers. Um, <laughs> and the other was to see firsthand how it all happens with, with Dan. Um, so we're in the process now of, of the very, very early stages of starting a business. And um, the, it's not a challenge because it, it's a problem. The industry that we've selected, the, the competition is Fortune 100 companies. And, and they're not going to go quietly, and we know that. But I think that's what's, what makes it very exciting. Um, the goals that I have, I've always wanted to take a company public. I want to do it as soon as we can get financials audited that, that are, that are you know, worthy of taking a company public. I see it in three to five years. And what I'd like to do is, is a lot of what people in here have already accomplished um, and are, are wanting to accomplish, and that's take the company public and do it again and do it again. And, and what I like about um, the situation I'm in today is I worked for a large corporation, Citicorp, where you got to make one decision in your whole lifetime. And, and even, <laughs> even if you did make it, they didn't take you up on it. Um, <laughs> what I like about with Dan is, is, you know, he's taught me it's okay to make decisions. It's okay to be wrong. And uh, you just keep making them. You just keep going. And, and have you been wrong lately? You haven't told me about. Uh, no, well, yeah, I've been wrong. We've been, we've been wrong. Um, okay. And everything's not great. So uh, there, there are a lot of not challenges. There are problems. I, I agree. Uh, but I'm very excited about it. I'm, I'm glad to be in an atmosphere where people think a lot alike or would like to take that next step. And uh, I also do want to add one point. Um, I don't believe in the seminar circuit. You know, this is my last seminar because I think there's a, you know, seminars are like uncles. Everyone's got one if you want to go to it. Um, the people that can do it and have proved it and they want to get up and explain it to you, you know, those are the people that I feel you should, uh, at least for me, you know, might not be for everybody. So, and, you know, I mean, I'm just from hearing people here, I'm easily the poorest person in this room and Dan's easily the richest. So <laughs> that's the reason, you know, that, that, uh, you I may not be the poorest. I, I you haven't I, read everybody's forms like I have. I mean, uh, so, the, but by the way, uh, you know, and I should have uh, given them a different kind of introduction. Both the, the Mosby's brothers, I call them my doofus brothers, uh, um, are running a company for me um, that I um, have a patent. And we'll talk about that tomorrow or Saturday. And uh, I've turned over the running of the company to them. And, uh, the, and uh, common sense. Conventional wisdom would say that you've got to be goddamn crazy, Dan, to turn it over to a, twi are you 28? 29. 29 and 28-year-old 28. 28 kids that don't, never run a business before, right? You never run, you work for Citicorp and you... Crown packaging. Yeah, Island. but before that... Uh, Monsanto. Monsanto. They have, their experience is 
Bubkus. But I have confidence, and I'm going to let you talk. Don't worry. You know, even though uh, your Go wife ahead. didn't come with you, your wife didn't come with you, right? No, she didn't. Okay, okay. His better half didn't come with him, but the I had confidence, and uh, and uh, and Jim basically sold me on his younger brother. I had confidence in John even before I met him. It was a little shaken after I met him, but I we still went forward with it. <laughs> and um, but I've turned this business over now. The, the company that we're competing with is Dupont. They have 99.99 percent of the market roughly speaking, and maybe more, maybe more. <laughs> and they have invested hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into this product and have controlled this product since the early 60s. And we have a product that we feel we know can compete effectively and kick their ass, basically. And, uh, uh, and I, I owned this once before, or I bought it when I was the chairman of a public company and as part of my settlement when I left Great Western, in addition to a lot of money, they gave me this company. Uh, that's uh, assets. There was, there was nothing running because they had put it on the back burner because my former uh, colleagues didn't understand it, I don't think. And so I've got it again, and I, uh, I feel very... Uh, I liked it when I bought it the first time. I liked it when I have it now, and I've turned over the running of it to, uh, to Jim and his brother John. John, why don't you get up now? Okay. Yeah, sure. Is there a Brian Wright in this room? No Brian Wright? Okay. Go ahead. Okay, uh... Yeah, my name's John Mosby. I'm not going to reiterate everything that my brother said, uh, but a couple points that are important. Number one, I don't think either of us know how to work in a business, run a business, or be in a business environment different than the way Dan's talking. Um, to say you're going to take your company public, that just happens. To say you're going to make hundreds of millions of dollars, that's what happens if you follow guidelines. Um, the key point is one day when my brother got home from the Jim Newman seminar, he called me and said, I'm going to call this guy. I mean, he was like this. I got a guy to call, and I'm, I just get on the other line and listen. I said, pick up the phone, call the guy. Pick it up. Let's go. And we hung up. I said, if you ever do that to me again, I'll kill you. <laughs> um, the reason I'm here is because my brother brought me, as he said, um, I do work for a company now in sales where I work as a straight commission sales rep. I get 33% of the profit of whatever I sell. The two owners of the company, $55 million in sales, they probably bring home 19 to $20 million profit afterwards, pay everybody. Um, they make two and a half, three million million, $3 million a year each. It is two and a half to $3 million more than they ever expected to make, and they're not going to touch anything. They're like the horse with the reins on, or with the blinders. Don't touch anything. Don't do anything. If this thing fell apart tomorrow, I'd be fine. I can't stand even being in there anymore. It's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's a farce that they, we have 80 salespeople doing that for them. Um, but as I was saying earlier, we, don't, we know of businesses run this way. That's just how it goes. You take the company public. You do another one. You do another one. You do another one. You keep your eyes out for new ideas. Dan said, if you start getting in that frame of mind, ideas will jump out at you. One already has for us. So um, we appreciate the opportunity, but it's something that we were going to do, we're going to do, and with Dan, and I'd like to say that we're working with him and not for him, um, because that was we another are. goal that we're going to do. We're not going to work for Dan, we're going to work with Dan. So uh, with that in mind, um, I have only been to one other seminar, and that was Tony Robbins. And he never said you can really make a mistake and make mistakes and do all this stuff because that's, you shouldn't be making mistakes if you're as good as you think you are. So, that's uh, bullshit. Yeah. With that in mind, um, I'm when glad you're allowing mistakes. When we're not on the camera, I'll tell you about all the mistakes Tony's made. And I mean, but my wife has lost in mink coats at airports more net worth than he's got. <laughs> well, that kind of puts it in a nutshell. And last but not least, when Dan's mentioning my wife, we just got married two months ago. And you're still married? Yeah. He asked me that every month as well. <laughs> and um, we had prefaced. Well, what, what happened was we had been out, my brother and I had been out to visit Dan about three times, been out to his castle once. And Dan called us and said, I want you guys to come back out. I want you to bring your wives. For nothing other than to meet my wife, to understand who I am, and understand the commitment that you're all going to put in this. And we had basically told our wives, whatever he says, don't say anything back. <laughs> So the only words that were uttered at the and time... And your wife didn't follow that instruction. No, she uttered one word, and that was um, at dinner, Dan raised a glass, and he said, you know, this is to make an, a, a hell of a lot of money. 
and she blurts out, Amen. Yeah. Uh, so she's on the same wavelength as well, or the same page as, as we're supposed to be. She, she, they were basking, their wives were basking out by the pool, and I have a, I have a uh, roughly speaking, a 210 degree view of the Pacific Ocean with Catalina out in my front. Newport, or excuse me, Malibu at one end and Newport Beach, and it's, it's a nice place, and, and they were basking in the sun, and I, I looked out, we were working inside, I went, I went out on the patio, I said, hey girls, have you been discovered yet? Like, you know, like starless. No, is somebody going to come? I mean, we're waiting, we're waiting. Uh, but an important thing that I want to uh, point out about John, we had a board meeting at the castle on August the 17th, I think it was, and I told Jim and John, I want you to be there to make a presentation to the board. And uh, this is my board for my holding company. And I didn't know that John was getting married in five days or eight days or whatever it was. I didn't really care. I didn't make, I didn't make a damn to me. And so, and then uh, he said, well, how long am I going to be there? I said, two, three days, well, you know. But the important thing is he came and, and, and just before his wedding, and I didn't ask him what his father, mother, in-laws, wife to be. I, I couldn't care less. But I can assure you, if he hadn't been at that meeting, his ass wouldn't be sitting here today and we wouldn't have gone forward with the project with him. Because I wouldn't care. Now, fortunately, he didn't have to postpone the wedding. It just happened. I didn't set the meeting up on purpose to do that. But he passed a big doofus test. <laughs> he did the right thing. Now, the, um, it's important. And that's why I have confidence in these two young men. And I've given them, you know, uh, an opportunity to make a, a ton of money and be equity principals in the, in, in the organization. And um, they're going to go out and meet one of our partners tonight. Don't let it. Well, you won't let them doofus you. This guy is a slippery. This guy is everything that is sneaky about business. Well, he's a 10 percent partner in, in, in the deal. He weaseled his way into this years ago. And this guy is slick. Slick. Let's see. Harvard, Cambridge. He doesn't talk about Pierce Junior College that he went to in the Valley. That's where he started. He lived around the corner from me, and I didn't know him. He was about four years younger than I, I was. And he, uh, former chief of staff of Governor Brown, Jerry. And I mean, this guy is slicker than baby shit. I mean, he's smooth. So, but I'm sending the two kids. Because this guy, you know, this guy's, this guy's good. He, he's extracted a lot of money and flesh off people over the years. But uh, we're sending the two, two, two kids to have dinner with him. They, and don't buy his dinner, remember. <laughs> yeah, don't buy his dinner. So, uh, but these guys have the right attitude. And uh, I feel comfortable. Uh, I'm the largest controlling shareholder. But, I mean, I feel comfortable. And uh, with this particular project, all the people that had been thrown out of the project that I felt ought to be back in, number one, the inventor, the people that have the UK license patent threw his ass out. See, now, to me, having the inventor on your team is probably smart. <laughs> so I brought his ass back in, you know? And uh, Dr. Eric White's his name, and he's a very bright guy, and uh, he's not used to dealing with cutthroat American businessmen, or these are happen to be Brits that threw him out. And so we're putting the team back together to go heads up with DuPont probably, and so um, it's going to be interesting over the next several years, and, and, uh, but we're talking about some big dollars, because one of the things we're going to talk about investment opportunities, people like, individuals like myself, I'm not interested unless I can make five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand percent of my money. I'm not interested in 15 percent compounded annually. I mean, I, could, I mean, I wouldn't roll over in bed for that. I mean, it's... It, it just has no interest, and people like myself aren't interested in that. I would rather take my money and have send my oldest son, who's not old enough to gamble, put it down on double zero in Vegas. High-performance people aren't interested in those kinds of rates of return. When Ross Perot gave Jobs $20 million to help start his company called Next, or Next, he was one of the initial investors, Ross was looking to make a billion dollars on his $20 million. So, I mean, and in my judgment, if the difference between interest rates, everybody bitches about interest rates, if the difference between 6 and 8% interest rates kills your deal, you ought to blow your brains out. You're looking at the wrong kinds of deals. I have a big arsenal at my house. I'll set you up. Some of my stars just walked in. 
Verdier is from uh, Baltimore or someplace like that. But we, we went to the University of Maryland together, we found out. Yeah, well, they're going to get a chance to talk. Put up a, uh, a seat. The, um, um, it's, these were control freaks. These were former control freaks. Now they're richer former control freaks. Um, but see, I feel comfortable with the young guys. There's not many guys my age that have been as successful. Well, virtually probably hardly anybody in this room would do what, I just, uh, what I've already done. And I've done two or three projects like that because I know three things. Number one, I can mold these guys and give them the right tools. They don't have as much preconditioned, crappy preconditioned thinking. Preconditioned thinking, number one. Number two, they've got good educations. Even though they were raised, they were raised there and educated in the Catholic system. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic myself, but uh, not, notwithstanding that, I mean, and you know, and they look like Mr. Clean. See, they got the, they got the Bruce Whipple look. See, now you see what he looks like. They got the IBM look. And it's easier to take a man or woman's money if you look like an IBM salesman. It's a lot easier. I mean, he looks sincere. I know him. I know better. But I mean. <laughs> But, I mean, that's why I told him, you've got to focus in on the Fortune 50, I mean, because he relates. They all look, don't you all look alike when you sit in the meetings? I mean, they all look alike. And, I mean, and, and the, you know, if, you, if you're going to go to Egypt, I dress like Egyptians. I mean, <laughs> it's that simple. And so, uh, the, uh, but that's the format that I use and have been pretty successful at it. And, uh, and I find these things to run, and, uh, and I let uh, young men like the, the Mose brothers run with them. Next. I'm, I'm Vince Pena, and uh, I'm Dan's kid brother. And um, I came to the first seminar uh, almost two years ago. Ja uh, May of 93. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, the first time I've been back since. And what I want to know is, every, have you been mentioning my name and referring to me ever since? Because if so... Yes. Uh, yeah, well, you owe me a little something. Yeah, okay. I do. And uh, a few other people here. Too. Vince was, uh, or I don't know if he still is, but when he was promoted, he was the youngest fire captain in the state of California. He's with the uh, Los Angeles County Fire Department. And uh, he was their, uh, or probably still is, their a child prodigy, the, the young guy that, uh, that is going to lead him into the next century. And um, the, uh, I'm old enough almost to be his father, but uh, my dad had a, we ain't going to talk about that, he had a, a second life. Uh, after I left home, but uh, and um, I do mention you. You probably have some royalties, do you? But um, <laughs> but uh, we'll talk about that later. Okay, later. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, what Dan says is correct. That um, at uh, one time I was the youngest fire captain on the job, and uh, and in the state, and uh, I've been a captain now for five years, and. Um, Ever since then, Dan has been hounding me and trying to, uh, you know, pound me and taking the next step up. And I've, uh, you know, I, I've uh, very comfortable where I am and wanted to get that balance and experience, which, which is uh, important in my field. But um, now I feel like I have the experience, especially um, uh, through proven ability, and uh, and I'm going to go for that next step up and start bumping through the ranks. And uh, even though it's it. Uh, my area of expertise is different than, uh, and than what most people here are shooting for. Uh, everything he says I use, and I've been using for 20 years. Everything he says, uh, it's not something that's made up to put on an overhead. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've heard all these things. I've heard them uh, in the back room. I've heard them on the golf course. I've heard them, uh, you know, when we've both been down on the ground. I mean, I've, this is, uh, he lives by this, and uh, it's his proven ability is why... Um, you know, I, I, I use him for advice, and and uh, he motivates me, and um, and uh, we'll do so throughout. And uh, so anyway, two things I want to get out of here is one, I'm here because I enjoy the uh, his motivation and the guidance that I get through him. Um, two, uh, it will help me bump up through the ranks, and which it did get me to where I uh, where I have been. And uh, and three, I've always been. Um, uh, caught up in the passion with uh, the fire service with my job and uh, now uh, uh, through that and through the experience uh, I've uh, found an area which is just ripe for the pickings to start a business which uh, uh, the, the time schedule of the firemen uh, you're able to do things off duty 
and um, it's just a business that's been, it's an area that uh, is in promotional workshops and training courses, which has only started the uh, last five to six years, and it's something that um, uh, is just ripe for the picking. There's only one person that does it worth a darn, and he's an L.A. City Battalion Chief, and I see flyers coming through the fire station all the time. I see guys of mine, not of mine, but guys on our department that are paying thousands of dollars for these courses. And, and it's, it's just, uh, it's killing me to see this, that uh, it's something that, um, one, I don't think, uh, um, you know, he's doing justice to the profession, and two, I think he could be had. And, um, and I've seen that because, uh, one, where I got myself without any help in, in a fast way, and two, um, uh, the men that I've had for the last few years, I constantly promote them and get them up through the ranks without paying thousands of dollars and without... Uh, any fa fancy program, so I think uh, that's something that can be marketed, and uh, that's uh, where my passion is, and um, and I know I'm good at it through proven ability, and um, that's just something that I think. Uh, uh, in fact, I know that uh, there's there's a market out there, and where it can end up, I don't know, and I don't care, because it's just so new, and um, uh, there's just so much there to be had. That uh, that's what I'm going to go for. Uh, Okay, thank you, Vince. The, uh, and coincidentally, the business that the Mosby's are running is a fire-resistant uh, 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 chemical process where you change the molecule, uh, molecules in the fabric to make it fire-resistant, more fire-resistant than DuPont's Nomex and Kevlar products. And coincidentally, uh, one of the reasons I have a great deal of comfort in the area is because my, my, my kid brother is in that business and has been instrumental in, in guiding us and uh, the... Um, and whereas he felt he needed more experience, he's in a life-death business. Except for the doctor. Where's the doctor? Unless you're a doctor. I mean, nobody in here is going to make a decision that actually in the cosmos of time is more than a fart in the wind. We aren't in the life-death business. Nobody has ever made a decision in the big picture scheme of things amounts to spit. Doctors, not all doctors, and I don't know what kind of doctor you are, but I mean some doctors actually make life-death decisions. Policemen, firemen make life-death decisions. You better be qualified. For us, it doesn't mean a damn whether we're right or wrong. Yet we labor. We kill ourselves. We pound the hell out of ourselves on some of these decisions. We load, load us one, two, three to death. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing that you've ever done in your career, nor probably nothing that you will ever do, henceforth, in the cosmos of time, means spit. So why do we beat ourselves up? Why do we spend such an inordinate amount of time deciding on what to do? Tomorrow and the next day, we're going we're gonna to go into that ad nauseum, because we're going to go around and we're going to talk to people about decisions that we've made. And nobody's made more wrong decisions in, the, in, in this room than me. Okay. Uh, Vera Dears, we're going to save to last. Uh, move the mic up. My name is uh, David Marshall. I'm from North Carolina. A um, little background. I'm 30 years old. Uh, I just sold uh, a company of mine. Um, and I'm in the process of the people that I sold it to, they want me... Uh, the guy that I sold it to that's running the company, he's spending most of his time buying other companies and growing the company. He wants me to help him work with taking that company public. Uh, that is one of the goals that I'm working on right now. Another goal that I'm working on is uh, in the information business uh, to do an online service, something along the lines of uh, Prodigy or America Online in, in that business. Um, so I came... Uh, I really came to this seminar to find out if I wanted to go to your seminar in Scotland. <laughs> well, yeah, the, I already can tell you the answer is yes. Yeah, well, no I question. figured that out already you know, this morning. You know, the, the, I can say with no, this is an experience, but the, the, the Scot Scotland is a quantum leap above this experience because you're being, you know, uh, when my butler comes and gives you, as the Verdiers or some of the other Burl, some of the other people that have been to the castle, it's a, it's a different thing. It's And, and I, I don't mean to interrupt, but See, he sold his business, you're only 30, right? Okay. I'll be 30 in March. 
So you're 29. Okay, he's getting young. He'll be 26 before the conversation's over. That's great. You know, I won't ask the question, how many sold a business when they were 29? How many had a business when they were 29? Okay, good. But, I mean, that, that is the kind of thing that we're going to develop over the next two, two plus days. Well, and that, that's really where I'm coming from. I, I don't have a, a, a Harvard education or any of that. I, Good, you got a chance. <laughs> I, I got started scrapping when I was a kid, and I've had businesses since I was a kid, and I've started some and I've bought some, and I've mostly been playing in the lower tier. And so I'm at that point in my life where I want to take that, to use your terminology, quantum leap into, you know, the big time and, and be a real player. And so that's what I'm working on. You want to hunt with the big dogs? I want to pee in the big, in the tall yeah, That's exactly the right. Dogs. Now, he, he's, he's, he's from a part of the country that understands hunting with the big dogs. That's right. So now, I'm trying to get off the porch. That's right. <laughs> how many have you, has any, you know, well, I'm going to, I won't ask the question. I'll give you the answer. If you read everybody's literature now, how many times do you see quantum leap program, quantum leap theory from all the gurus now? It's all over. Now, uh, the, the, uh, you know, I should be happy that everybody's, you know, stealing my stuff. But I, they may be stealing the title, but that's it. Because there's nobody out there that I'm aware of that can teach the methodology. But there's a lot of quantum leap guys now, but I mean, there's, there's not that much quantum leap methodology. But you will, I mean, it's great that you've sold the business and you've been in businesses, and some of the business you've lost money, right? <laughs> I've had some big dogs. Yeah, yeah, some big dogs. <laughs> and that's just the point. I mean, he's, he, he's been out there amongst them. And uh, you want to hunt with the big dogs. That's what it takes. You've got to be out there among them. You've got to be taking, you know, not necessarily risking your net worth like I've done four or five times in my career. But, I mean, you've got to be out there amongst them. So, so uh, this is the first I've had been exposed to you, and I'm, I'm very impressed with what well, I've heard so you. far. Well, thank you. Thank you. But I would the be other gurus, and I didn't I, care I'd be, them. I'd be surprised if you weren't impressed, <laughs> you know, so, quite frankly. You. I'd be surprised. Yes, sir. My name is Mike Crabb. I was down at the San Diego conference like a few of us were down there. And uh, actually, I think I got more excited about Dan's seminar because I had gotten some material on it. But I think the marketing piece that was sent out intrigued me more than all of the other stuff that I got. So I kind of took a risk. And Ed's uh, looking for a raise now. <laughs> did you do it? Yeah. Oh. Well, it, it intrigued me because uh, my philosophy has always been uh, I wanted to roll with the guys who've already done it. Then. I go down there and find out that Dan says uh, uh, he's been there and he's done that. And that's the kind of... Not only of said it, I've done it. Yeah. And he also did it, and, and the piece actually uh, referred to it. Uh, I've been in the travel business for uh, well over uh, 15 years, in the airline, the uh, travel wholesale, and just recently the hotel business. And I've basically made a lot of companies money, and, uh, but I've been dictated all my life. And uh, I'm going through a transition right now. and. Uh, went to the uh, conference this past uh, month or so to take a look at other opportunities and I think I've uh, kind of narrowed it down to about two or three. Uh, but what was more important to me when I went to uh, Dan's uh, workshop down there was uh, the principles and attitudes that uh, I have already shifted since then. I'll give you an example. Yesterday I, uh, I like that term, uh, he who writes the first draft wins. Uh, yesterday I went to a, a negotiating meeting and I have to Got up at 7.30, uh, blitzed this uh, proposal yesterday. Uh, I set it up with my partner. I think I used all the principles. I took my vice president with me to this meeting. Uh, I purposely sat him down in a certain position. I sat across the direct person. Uh, and then we figured out afterwards that after the negotiating, we had saved ourselves $10,000 just by writing the, doc the document. Uh, it was also important for me to have my vice president with me there, but... I think I utilize a lot, uh, a lot of the principles that, that Dan uh, talks about. I think what I really want to get out of this, uh, uh, this weekend is to really get, I guess maybe, I think we all have fears, and I think uh, Dan has this kind of attitude where you either get it or you don't or hit the high road. So um, That's pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. So I think, I think I'm, I, I, that's what I really want to get out of it. And, um, and I, I think I have a goal of uh, getting a 67 million in the, the next five years net worth. And so uh, I'm looking at businesses right now, and uh, I hope to meet and talk to some of you 
here as well and also get some uh, good information uh, before I leave. Let me comment a couple things on this, what he said. I can guarantee, there's not many guarantees in life and I don't give many guarantees at the seminar, but I can guarantee you this. If you're willing to bust your ass and work like a dog and exclude everything, family, God, country, everything. If you don't make that money, it's, it's because you got run over. Or, I mean, so, I mean, there's just, this, the trick or the formula or the methodology or the precepts are so damn easy. When the Verdiers get up, I'm not saying it's because that they, you know, they're simple people. That's not, because I went to, I actually went to college with them, kind of. But it's simple. For the people that, you know, Burl's getting ready to get, get up here and, 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 and she's one of my superstars. But I mean, and I'm not, and I'm not taking anything away from Burl. Uh, well, not too much anyway. She's, you know, she's not that smart, but I mean. IQ yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it's not that hard. It just isn't. If it was that hard as, as uh, co some of the guys that I went to college with, they, Penny couldn't have figured it out. I mean, it just isn't. But what it takes is it takes a complete change in the way you think. That's what's hard. The actual doing it, like this young lady, I mean, figured it out in about two, two minutes. I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling how she figured that out so quickly. But that's what's difficult. It's getting over all the bullshit that we've been inundated with all our lives by everybody that we have to do with, you know, the guys we play golf with, uh, play bridge with, go to the gym with, eat lunch with, go into school with, etc., etc., etc. That's what's difficult. And the hardest thing for some of you in this room is to stop hanging around with the doofuses you hang around with because that's become habit the morons you hang around with, the know-nothing morons. They're debilitating. The second heart, or for some of you, the hardest thing, believe me, be harder than is to, not, to, to limit your association to your doofus parents and your doofus family. That's tough. Impossible for some people. My name is Brill Crump. I'm from Ottawa, Canada. I met Dan about 18 months ago um, at a somebody else's seminar. Um, Dan, cover your ears. In San Diego, he talked about seminar junkies. Um, four years ago, I sold my real estate company. They gave me a good whack of cash, and then they paid me royalties every month for three years. So I was wandering around aimlessly, didn't know what to do, except for spend $73,000 on seminars. Jesus Christ. I didn't know this. I know. This is, I, don't, I, I didn't know this. Cover your ears. Okay. I don't go to seminars anymore unless Dan is there or other Dan seminars. Um, so I was kind of aimlessly, uh, I knew what I wanted, but I didn't find it in anybody else. And I've seen them all. There isn't anybody. I have their tapes, their books, their videos, their autographs. I mean, just got everything. And uh, <laughs> the first time I seen Dan, I couldn't relate. I mean, he just was, he was too, he was larger than life. He, he, he was where I wanted to be, but I didn't know. I mean, I was just, you know, just somebody that runs a small business and, and that wanted to be very wealthy. Um, when I met him, I'd done okay. I probably my net worth was between five and six million dollars. Uh, nothing that I consider very wealthy, but some people would. Um, today, in less than 18 months, my in, my net worth, personal net worth now, not my businesses, are, are somewhere between 20 and 30 million. And uh, I know Dan's discounting that, but I've already discounted it, so you don't have to do that. Yeah, you're right. I was just trying to put don't. The I've already done it. Put the doofus yeah. factor on it. You're uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, I, I was doing. A two million dollar deals, four million dollar deals, making twenty thousand on a deal, eighty thousand I think was the biggest I'd ever make. Now I'm doing forty six point five million dollars and making close to twenty million dollars on my deals. So that's a quantum leap. Um, la in and we went to um, uh, the castle in May, and I watched him and he was telling about doing all these deals. I thought I got to do a deal. I mean I got to find some idiot out there that I can bring to him that we'll do a deal. Lo and behold, I got three of the ugliest frogs that you ever met. I mean, I'm kissing them big time, but oh, they're bad. And so I brought them down, and uh, we went over to Dan's house, and he sits in his living room, and he, you know, he does everything he says in the seminar. I mean, I was waiting for some big revelation. I was really disappointed because he does exactly what you see. And um, we're still working on that deal. I, I don't know if it's going to happen or if it's not. I don't know. But since then, uh, I've got two or three other things on the go. And by this time next year... I, it's going to be scary, but what I will be worth. And that's all I can say. Um, I've been to see 
Burl's operation in Canada, and uh, and I gave her some insight. She was a control f freak, as w were the Verdiers that are going to talk in a little while. Hopefully, they'll, they'll bless us with some of their words of wisdom. And uh, I went up to look at her operation, and I basically told her to stay out of this operation, hire a CFO, do this. It didn't take me long. We were there, you know. And, um, but unlike most people, she actually did it. I mean, you know, big, big revelation. I mean, I can walk into anybody's business here, and one of the people hopefully we're going to talk to, maybe on the phone, a guy I spent 20 minutes with, 20, that I turned his whole company around because I could probably, if it takes me more than a half a day, something's wrong with me, or, you know, I got a hangover, or something's wrong. Because there, there's, there's, there's just not that many things that can go wrong with a business. It's one, it's either external or internal. That's where you start. We'll talk about more tomorrow. There's only two ways a deal can go down the toilet. And those are, those are them, external or internal. And then when I find that it's external, I devote all my energies looking at external things. If I think it's internal, then I go internal. But when, with, with her business, it was obvious to me, she was running a construction company and she was doing several other things, that she, did, she could look at land and she knew a piece of land was hot or it wasn't hot. I mean, that's simple. And she didn't need any Lotus 1, 2, 3 to do it. And in fact, her 67 or whatever million deal she just did was on one piece of paper, her proposal to the, uh, these doofuses that you're taking the money from. Okay, yeah. one piece, right? Yeah. One side of the paper. Yeah. Yeah. And they got all nervous. They came up to see her in Canada because they, you know, let me, this lady must be trying to trick us. She said, cost this, this, my profit. And that was it. And so after they came up there and they audited her and looked her over, they uh, 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 essentially agreed with your numbers. Yep. yep. And so, I mean, just imagine if a regular company had done that. There would have been 900 pages of crap. I mean, when I come in and look at a company, normally what I do is before, before bre I have breakfast with the people, breakfast with the chairman, then I spend the morning not with the people that kiss the chairman's ass, but the level of people below the people that kiss the chairman's ass. Okay. Then I have lunch with the people that kiss the chairman's ass. Then I spend all afternoon into the evening with marketing and salespeople. I go out and I get drunk with them. I used to have sales meetings when I ran a, a real estate sales organization. We used to have margarita hour. We drink pictures of margaritas. I found out more about the company and I find out more about everybody else's company. The next morning I go in to the... Um, to the chairman and I do this this company X Y how do I get this piece of shit <laughs> X Y Z and we list number one two, three, and we go down to ten. The ten doofus things this company's doing. <coughs> then I go like this. We draw, this is not, new, oh, this is not a new deal. They did it with uh, U.S. Steel. Schwartz did it to Carnegie, right, Bruce? And I want you to focus the next 30 days on number one. I'll be back in 30 days. No written report, no nothing. I come back in 30 days, if he has worked on anything other than number one, our relationship is over. Period. If he's worked on one and he's probably solved it, then we do, I do the same thing again. Breakfast, lunch, the same business because the deals always change. Business is not static, ladies and gentlemen. Just, this is what I found 30, 30 days later. It's probably got new problems. So then I go through again, then we do the same thing, 30 days. And I keep doing this month after month. And, and I'm not here, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but... When I do this, I get paid $3,000 an hour or $25,000 a day, whichever's more, not whichever's less. <laughs> or I take a minimum of 15% of the company based on what, how we turn it around and how we make it better with an option to buy 10% of the company when we go public at whatever the book value is, not giving it away. And that's what I do. But this is all. And with Burl, it was simple. Because the girl had good common sense. She did something very well. I said, forget all this other crap. Very much like I told Bruce Whipple. Focus in on the IBM guys that all look like you. It's an easier sale. And, that's, and it's that simple. Yet Arthur uh, Anderson Consulting will come in and spend six months, 
and 900 pages of bullshit. Business isn't that difficult, ladies and gentlemen. It just isn't. It just isn't. I mean, my, my track record is pretty darn good. I mean, the, um, except for a couple of people that have died <laughs> in the middle of their programs and their companies were liquidated, I've got, you know, I've got pretty close to 100% track record. <clears throat> but the caveat is, if you don't do what I say, and I'm not telling you, leverage your company, borrow a billion dollars, etc. If you don't do what I say, our business relationship is over. Because if I can't control, then I don't, not control on the day-to-day -day function, but if I can't control the information and what you're going to do, and if you're not going to follow up on it, then I don't want to have anything to do with it. Because I realize, then I'm not there for the, you know, then I, rev I don't want to actually get paid the $3,000 an hour. I want the equity in the deal. Burl has been a big success. She's just beginning to get her stride. She went to the, uh, she's been using the Royal Bank of Canada for 25 years, right? She told me, I'm, I can't hardly say this without choking, that the Royal Bank of Canada had never turned her down in all those years, right? I see. You're obviously not asking for enough money. I mean, <laughs> I mean, banks turn me down all the time. Because I always ask for at least three to five times more money I think I need. Because when I borrow money, I take a company public, I've always paid myself. We're going to talk about it tomorrow next time. I take a big chunk and I pay myself a bonus. I pay everybody involved in the deal a bonus. I used to pay three to $10 million on a deal in bonuses. This is out of the equity that I get from the bank, the money that I borrowed. And she's never been turned down. I said, you've got to change your attitude with the banks. And she has. She did a huge no money down deal, which she showed me that's that property by your place. And she's flipped the, uh, the switch on the bank, you know, because the bank doesn't want to lose her business. And banking's tough in Canada because of all the doofus rules they've got. But, I mean, and she's just taken the ball and run. And she's, I mean, she's been over the goal several times now since our, our relationship has started. And so it's not, and I'm not demeaning or saying any of the people that have been successful aren't that bright. But we're not that, I mean, maybe Whipple is because he looks brighter than he is. <laughs> But I mean, uh, certainly when the Verdiers get to talk here in a little bit, they're certainly, they don't even look bright. They look young. They're, like, they're almost as old as me. Look at how young they look. Okay, next. Young lady with a tough handshake. Hello, my name is Naima, and I have my own cosmetic company, and I distribute my products to Southern California Broadway. Is anyone familiar with that chain of stores? Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit how I started. I came here with a dream, and my life has been very, um, I won't say planned, but I always knew my destiny. I grew up in a, a lower middle uh, income family. My father is a minister, and I had a mother as a housewife. I didn't see too much benefit in that, so I said, no, I'm not going that way. And um, I decided early on in my life that I wanted to be immensely wealthy. I, I don't know where that came from. No one in my family had acquired a lot of money, but I know that I, I did not want to have one or two million dollars. That didn't even seem rich to me. So um, I just kind of feel that it's my destiny to be very wealthy, provide a lot of opportunity for women. I came out here about 17, 18 years ago with a dream. The dream was to get a job in a field that I loved and I was passionate about. I mean, work my behind off, not to get another opportunity because I was cute or I said hi, nice, but because I knew my business. I worked as a, I started as a salesperson, making about $3.25 an hour. After that, uh, I caught a couple of management eyes. They felt that I could be an assistant manager. I went into <coughs> assistant manager for the Broadway uh, about maybe three years after that. They felt that I could be a manager because I was doing the work anyway. I was a little fearful about going into management because I knew then I would have to take all of the heat no matter if things weren't done right. I had three children at the time and really do I want to put that much energy in someone else's business when my purpose was to come out here and to have my own business. But I felt I needed more training, more insight into the business I chose. Um, I worked at that. Uh, I accepted that and uh, went on, and I did very well at that. And I think it was because I always love to motivate people to do what you do well. And if you do it well and if you're passionate about it, you don't have to worry too much about the competition. 
After that, um, J.C. Penney's heard about me. They hired me as a cosmetic man uh, merchandise manager. So now I'm buying cosmetics. I'm developing a staff. I'm motivating them, and I'm trying to get the women to do the best job they could. Not so much for myself, but I believe that if you get people to enjoy what they're doing and do it well, they will always go the extra mile because they're feeling good about it, and you're letting them do what they do best. So I stayed there for about a year. A man by the name of Mr. Johnson, who owns Johnson Publishing Company, called me from Chicago. My name came up a couple of times in this area. He needed an account executive for cosmetics to be a um, account executive. Oh, and so many people told me, oh, Naima, you can't do that. You can't be an account executive. You can't be a manager. You have three children. You're married. You, and you're black. You can't do all of these things. But every time someone told me I couldn't do it, I knew that I could, not only because I knew that I could, but I had read something about Henry Ford, where Henry Ford didn't even pass the fourth grade, but he hired the Harvard and the Yale guys. But he had the Dime vision. a dozen. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he had the vision. So I knew that if I just could cultivate my vision and bring it to fruition in my mind and visualize it, I could get the staff that could help me achieve my goal. After working for Mr. Johnson and falling deeply in love with him, he is a black man. He is one of the wealthiest black people in the country. Good place to start. <laughs> but it's a lot easier to fall in love with money. I mean, just as easy, I should say. For me, well, it's I, a lot easier, but... I fell in love with his mind. I fell in love with he could discipline himself to step through the crap and get what he wanted. And I would be sit sitting in a sales conference, and I said, how can I get from here to there? That was the only question that just kept coming up. Well, because I fell so in love and in awe with this man, we, you know, it was nothing, you know, outside, in no bedroom or anything, but just come, I just loved his um, fortitude and all of what he had done in the time that he had came from, because he came up in the 40s and the, the 50s where, you know, you could, they told you you couldn't do anything if you were black. So, um... I worked for him for seven years. My plan was to work for him only two years and then go for my business. But because I got caught up in his vision, and I was doing basically what I love to do, and that is to go into stores, hire women, motivate them, try to get them past their families, um, not spending all the money on their children and their husbands and all of their energy and effort, but save some time for themselves and to develop the gift that God had given them. After I did that for seven years, I could not rest, I could not sleep. Something inside said, you have to do it. You've got to go for it. Why I was so excited about getting an opportunity with Mr. Johnson? Because it was like destiny had given me a man that had the road map. And I was so excited. I mean, the plane, I think, brought me in there about 35,000 feet. But oh, I was about 100 feet above sea level. And uh, when I got to meet him, I was just so in awe of him and when they told me he liked me I said oh my god that's great well I worked for him for seven wonderful years and I know that I have been called to do what I'm doing because I could not sleep I was up at night watching Tony Robbins and oh my god what am I gonna do how can I enter a cosmetic feel in the department stores where you have to have millions of dollars to even approach them to even be attracted to them so what I did, I worked on my dream. I worked on what I felt that I could offer women in a product. I came up with the idea. I called a lady who was a, um, she called on the Broadway stores. She was like a, she uh, represented, she represented other cosmetic companies. So I asked her would she go in there for me and talk to them. And then the night before the meeting took place, I was laying in the bed and I said, no one can tell it like you can. You are going to be the CEO of the company, the president. Nobody can speak it like you. So what I did, I called the lady and I said, I'm going with you. I knew once I did that, I was out of a job because the cosmetic field is very, very small. I went in and I talked to the, to the buyer. I had only a picture. I didn't even have enough money to get a mock-up, nothing. I just had my passion, my commitment, and a picture. 
and I told them that this is what I want to do, this was the market that I was after, and they said, okay, Naima, we want you. I was so happy. I said, my dream is coming true. I'm visualizing things. Oh, it's going to be such a success when it goes in. And I could see the people buying my product, and it didn't happen. The product went in. I found a manufacturer that uh, manufactured my goods on a handshake. No money. No money. Just a handshake. Offshore. He delivered my goods on time within the 30 days P.O. that the Broadway gave me and the merchandise set. It sold pretty good, but not as well as we had anticipated. So for the last year and a half, it has been a struggle to keep my vision alive and not look at my circumstances, but always keep my eye on the vision. So I'm just so happy to be here with a gentleman that has a roadmap to several millions, <laughs> hundreds of millions, that I could take back to my company and instill some of the, the philosophies that he has to make my company a multi-million dollar company. Um, I see myself going worldwide. I'm not going to be a child of just America. I want to be a child of the universe. <clears throat> so I want to offer my products. I have an opportunity to do business in South Africa. I feel that that is